This morning, glad to see your shiny, shiny faces. <laughs> um, okay, um, let us start our morning by scripture reading. Today we will be reading from um, Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in which, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also, in, in him you are also, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. All right, let us pray. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much for just that we get to gather every week um, as one body to worship you and to just um, praise you for all the ways that you um, do great works in us and through us um, and just um, that we have the ability to come together as a family to support one another um, by just sharing the love that you are passing down to us every morning and um, that we get to just worship you every week by lifting up um, songs to you and pouring out our hearts to you. I pray um, that you just bless um, Ben as he leads us in worship um, and I pray for Matt as he opens up the scriptures today and just leads us in what you are speaking to him and all the wisdom that you have passed down to him, Lord. Um, let our hearts be open to hear from you and just be um, steady and silent before you to learn more from you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, guys. Would you stand with me this morning? Yes, Lord, we just want to welcome your spirit this morning. We want to calm our hearts to you our tiredness this morning, our excitement. I'm going to focus our hearts on you and let our lift our voices up to praise you and express our gratitude. Broken hearts declare His 
took a breath And when I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderful in me You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay
Second Peter. So go ahead, if you have your copy of Scripture, and open them to Second Peter chapter two. Uh, this letter of Scripture is actually one of the most neglected in the entire New Testament, and I think we'll start to see why uh, this morning, as we find some of the most scalding rebukes against false teachers um, in the entirety of the Bible. Uh, Peter's going to use some intense language. But I believe that the warning that he's going to give us is an important for us to study as we are pursuing godliness. So if you remember chapter 1, he's saying pursue godliness. He kind of focuses on that, and then he's going to transition and say, like, be, be warned, there are false teachers. And you need to be mindful of that as you're pursuing godliness. So let me pray for us again before we get into the word. God, we come to you this morning. We pour out our hearts. God, we do want to pursue you. We come in with all of our pains and burdens and worries of the week, our anxieties. God, even my own heart, for whatever reason, I just don't feel settled. And so, God, I just ask that uh, you would settle the room. 
that your calming peace would come and wash over every single one of us, knowing that your spirit is present with us. God, that you would speak to us this morning. As we look at some strong language, some intense warnings, God, we figure out how we apply that to our lives and to our day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, tomorrow evening, 70% of Americans, uh, some of you included, will pretend to be someone or something else. Uh, in fact, I found a picture of our fearless worship leader from last year. Um, an alien had abducted him, apparently, and was trying to keep him from getting married, and thankfully, uh, that was just a uh, pretend scenario. I-, I almost asked him to wear that this morning, but I thought it would be way too distracting. And you, and you can take the slide off, because it's you can go back to the previous slide, because it'll be... Uh, too distracting to it up there. But we all enjoy pretending to be someone or something else, whether it's a costume party at some point in the year, whether it's tomorrow evening. But just because you put on some type of costume, I remember as a kid I was usually an NBA star because I thought I was going to the NBA. You couldn't convince me otherwise. Or I was Rocky Balboa because I thought he was real. And so uh, just because I put on those outfits didn't make me into an NBA star. It didn't make me into this professional boxer. The same is true when it comes to gospel-centered, biblically faithful teachers of Scripture and false teachers. Just because a false teacher might use some similar language, it might sound similar. You might say, but they use that. They they may even um, say things that sound very Christian or they should be Christian. Like, shouldn't that that be? Like, that's, that's kind of positive thinking. It doesn't make them true biblical teachers. And that's what Peter's going to warn us about here. In chapter 1, it was mostly a positive focus. And he's saying, I'm encouraging you, I'm reminding you, pursue godliness. And now in chapter 2, he's actually going to keep the same focus, but he's coming at it from the negative perspective. So he's kind of like, let me start with the positive, right? And that's how feedback usually goes in in meetings with your boss, right? Let me get the positive if they're a good boss. Let me get the positive. Now let me kind of say, hey, this is where where you're falling short. In this case, he's saying, hey, here's what you need to pursue. Do this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hey, be mindful, be warned, this is going to happen. And so the chapter that we're starting, like I said, it contains some really scalding rebukes for false teachers in the Bible. And may that be a warning for our day. Whether you're you're a teacher um, like myself, I put myself in that category at least on the weekends, and maybe you do that some throughout your week, or whether you're a hearer, may we be warned of what it is that is being taught and what we are actually hearing, which is one reason I always say, open your copy of Scripture or open the app on your phone, go home and study this. Because I don't want you to just take my word for it. Now, in 2,000 years of church history, many have abandoned the faith. And many more will do the same before Christ's second coming. In the age of the internet and social media, it seems like we're seeing these stories quite regularly, quite frequently, right? You'll have kind of um, known Christian artist, maybe a musician, maybe a pastor, maybe a professor, And they've written books, and they've sold them, and people are following them, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, actually, I don't believe this anymore. I I am turning away. And while that's sad and painful to see, it's always a little kind of like, uh, it kind of hits me suddenly, and it's like, I need to step back and kind of take a look at this. It'll mess with you. Because they've now turned their back, or supposedly turned their back on the God of salvation, the God they said they loved, the God they proclaimed. But when we be reminded, I think it's what Peter's going to tell us, this is actually nothing new. For us, it's just that it happens to be we have the internet, and, and we have social media, and so we learn of these things very quickly, and it kind of spreads, and then it's like, hashtag whoever this author was, or hashtag whoever this pastor was, and, and so we kind of learn of it quickly, but I think we look back, and, and the, the Bible, though, this actually was always happening. It's just now we learn of things more quickly, more frequently. Uh, the Apostle Paul actually mentions eight examples in his letters, but I'm just going to mention one of them. I actually came across this this week. This is in uh, 2 Timothy 4.10. The Apostle Paul warns uh, Timothy, I don't have a slide for it, he says, uh, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. This was a ministry partner. He didn't leave out of love for Jesus. It says he left out of love for the world. That's the same reason that anybody leaves. The love for the world becomes more attractive to them than the love of Jesus and pursuing godliness. He didn't leave to follow Jesus. He left to Jesus to embrace the world, the pleasures of the world, the entertainments of the world, the kickback of the world, the praise of the world, the friends of the world. This is why his ministry partner left. And so a warning label comes with the next two sermons because it's going to take two weeks to go through chapter two. So this is when the dashboard lights come on. It says check engine or oil low. Here's your warning going into this next two sermons. 
There's a lot around the idea of judgment in this chapter. This is one of those chapters I would say if I wanted to be a false teacher, I would not preach this chapter. I would skip over this chapter because we don't hear very many sermons, right? It's not a very topical sermon like, hey, come hear our judgment series. <laughs> it's Halloween, ah, dun, dun, right? Like, we don't hear of that very frequently, which is one reason we always say like to preach verse by verse through the books. And judgment's right here. Judgment is in the text. I think, I know we focus on God's love, rightfully so. But there is this, this other side that we sometimes don't hear about a whole lot. And God is a God of justice, which is why I believe it's important for us to wrestle through these passages when it talks about judgment. What does this mean? What does this mean for me in my life? How do I apply this to my life? And you think about God's judgment. It's necessary because it's rooted in God's holy character. His sovereignty, his righteousness. God always does what is right. Just look throughout history. God always does what is right. And so this, this chapter, recognizably so, can be really difficult to hear. And it might be difficult for you to hear this morning. Honestly, that might be why I feel a little unsettled in my own spirit. It's kind of difficult to, to wrestle through this and then say, man, I hope to faithfully proclaim this uh, to those at Sojourn. It also speaks of heresy. And in our modern culture, I think we are, we're mindful, we're weary to not call anything, don't worry about the slides, you can just listen. I know I talk fast, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, and we're weary to call anything heretical. We're kind, of, we're kind of cautious, right? And I'm not saying we should just kind of slap that label around, but we're, we're really weary to call anyone out. We're, we're weary to call them to the mat. Which is why we frequently hear this phrase, your truth or my truth. Right? We're like, well, that's, that's your truth. And this is my truth. But the idea that there's such a thing as the truth, and that someone's else truth could actually be wrong, have you ever considered that? And I think you can say that very firmly and simply in conversation with people. Like, have you ever considered your truth might be wrong? Well, then what? And this is where you put a big question mark, dot, 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 and kind of shut up. That's where I'm usually bad, I keep talking. But that their truth could actually be wrong, or even heretical, that would be problematic for many, but there is such a thing as truth. John 14, 6 reminds us, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life. If you haven't learned by now, we're all about Jesus here. Hopefully you'll hear Jesus' name more than any other name proclaimed at Sojourn. So this morning, we're going to break down the passage uh, with looking at it in three parts. The first part, which is already up here behind me, we're going to look at the false teachers and their followers, how he describes false teachers, and then how he describes those who follow false teachers. Uh, then we're going to look at God's judgment in the past. He's actually going to rewind the tape, and he's going to say, look, here has God, has, has, his judgment has come upon different groups and individuals in the past. And then he's going to look forward to God's rescue and God's coming judgment. And so let's look at, at first at false teachers and their followers from verses 1 through 3 of 2 Peter 2. It says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, you will, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So Peter starts this chapter with a conjunction, but he's linking it back to chapter 1, where he referred to true prophets. So he's already said, hey, there are true prophets. This is where the word of God came from. This is why you can trust the word of God. But now he's turning and warning us of the presence of false prophets. And so Peter says, just like there were false prophets in the Old Testament, there will also be false teachers among you. Now, he's presently writing the New Testament, but for us in the New Testament and thereafter. Matthew 7, 15 tells us to be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. There's a reminder for us, sinner. They're not going to come in with a sign that says, I am a false teacher. I am here to trick you. I am here to do this and to sway you. They're going to come in, and they're going to, you're, not, you're not necessarily going to recognize them. They're going to have a really good costume on, right? They're not going to stand out like Ben wearing an alien carrying him around. 
It's not going to be that obvious. And so the reminder for us then is that there will be, it's the language they use, so don't be caught off guard when you encounter false teachers, but always be mindful of them, that it's always possible. They're always present. And so think about false teachers in biblical history. I asked my family this yesterday to see who would get it right. Who was the first false teacher in biblical history? You can answer this. The devil, the devil Satan, in the Garden of Eden, right? We, really early in the book, we find this, this false teacher here. And what was his process? Okay, you can look this up later. Look up uh, Genesis 3, uh, really just, yeah, folks in chapter 3. The first thing he does is the word of God is questioned. All right, he comes to, to Eve and says, did, did he really say this? And it's like, okay, I've got this question now in my mind. Is it actually, did God actually say this with his words? Then the word of God is denied. And then finally, the word of God is distorted. It's the same process that we see today. People start questioning God's word. Well, I don't know that I actually said that. Or maybe if we take this out, or maybe we turn this word and we can make it say this. Then we deny God's word. Well, I'm going to stick with the comfortable parts that don't talk about judgment and don't talk about the way that we live and pursuing godliness. And then we distort God's word. Actually, it says this. It's essentially, what I see happening around us is, uh, and I think this is what he's going to refer to here, I'm going to pack it further, is the false teachers of our day would say, live however the heck you want. Add Jesus to the side and keep being who you are. You be you. I be me. Live your truth. Hey, Jesus. It's like, you know, like the whole Jesus is your homeboy t-shirts, which I kind of thought was funny. I think that's where I came from. Jesus is my homeboy. I can live however I want, but he's my homeboy. We're going to party on the weekends. We're going to live our life this way. He's my homeboy. It's like, no, Jesus is your savior. He's not your homeboy. As Warren Worsby writes, Satan has false Christians, a false gospel, and even a false righteousness. One day he will present to the world a false Christ. Federal agents don't learn to spot counterfeit money by studying counterfeits. I looked this up this week to verify this because many have told this story. I thought, is that actually true? They study genuine bills. They get the $100 bills, the $50 bills, and they, they study the real thing. They master it. They know exactly what to look for, where the line is, they, you know, how to hold up the light, all of that. They know what the real thing looks like. So when they encounter a bogus bill, they recognize it right away. Now, to you and I, we'd probably be like, dang, I just got 100 bucks down on the ground. And it could be a counterfeit. But they would recognize it right away. And what Peter's doing, he's reminding us back in chapter 1. He wants us to grow so much in our knowledge of Christ and our godliness that if and when we encounter false teachers and a false teaching, that we will quickly be able to recognize this is a bogus claim. That we'll be able to recognize the difference. You get that? You want to grow so much in your knowledge, in your pursuing God and godliness, that as soon as you come across it, it's easy to spot. That, that is actually contrary to what God's word says. That is contrary to what we have been taught by God. And the goal of the false teachers is to dr drive disciples away from the truth. Peter actually tells us how they work, who they deny, and where they are headed. So I want to look at those briefly. How they work. They secretly bring in destructive heresies because they're operating under the influence of Satan. They won't tell you who they are. They may even have the name of Jesus in their description. Okay? I was going to be careful and kind of discern what groups I would call out, but I believe it's Jehovah's Witnesses that stand in front of New Seasons. Very nice ladies. So I'm not saying being disrespectful or mean to them, but they are not the same as what we are. They do not believe the same that we are. But it sounds similar. Sounds good. It's not the same. Tells us who they deny. They deny Jesus by their beliefs. They deny Jesus by their lifestyle instead of what we should do, which is delight in Jesus. Tells us where they're headed. Destruction and judgment. Why destruction and judgment? Because of the destructive heresies, which are destructive to true faith. It's breaking down true faith. It's breaking down the church of Jesus. And so as Peter gets into verse 2, he focuses on those who follow these teachers. So we kind of looked at, these are the false teachers. Now let's look at the characteristics of those who follow them. Namely, that they pursue sensuality, and many will follow. So the, the, the heresies that will come in are characterized by sensuality. Essentially, the, the Greek meaning of this, um, this word that's used here, is a lack of self-constraint, abandonment to, to immoral behavior. Most, most often, this is referring to sexual sin. Okay? Once again, not a very popular topic that you don't hear talked about. Go 
Go talk to your friends this afternoon and say, our pastor preached about judgment and sexual immorality today. And see what kind of looks you get. But when someone teaches, you can continue to live however you want and still have Jesus, then many will follow him. Now, there's no guarantee, but I guarantee I know how to grow a church if it was about getting an audience in a crowd. And I'm going to be transparent. I wish this room was full. <laughs> there are, I prayed that this morning. There's, there's weeks that's really challenging for me, just to be transparent to you. I'm human. And I know how I can get more people in here. But I refuse to compromise in order to do it. And if I start doing that, call me out and say, do you not remember this, Second Peter, you dummy? But one aspect of their teaching at this time was that they could do whatever they wanted to do sexually. They could, consider, they could continue to sleeping together without being married. They could be in a same-sex relationship. They could change your gender and on and on and on. Do we not hear this being taught today? You might say, that, that's judgmental. That's not judgmental. I love every single category I just put in there because I really just put in every single category of people, if I'm not mistaken. But they teach, continue to live however you want. Do this because this doesn't address it. Actually, it does. Have you opened it? Have you read it? We still hear this today. Now look at the second part of verse 2. It's because of this way of living. This is the way of truth. The gospel will be blasphemy. Go back to the very first slide. Okay? Pay attention to where the slides are going. Very first one. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Peter's main point was that the gospel, what he called the way of truth here, would be slandered because of the impact of the false teachers. In other words, when professing believers start to compromise, start to say, kind of live however you want, the lifestyle full of sensuality and lies, the, the non-believing world around them starts to conclude, this is not really a way of truth. This is just another way of truth. This isn't the way of truth. This is another way, another way of, of living. This is a way of error. Right? It doesn't look any different than how I live. You've just got this religious component, or what I call your lucky rabbit's foot. Right? <laughs> I've got this, and, and you've got that, but we kind of both are still living the same way. And we're not, we're not pursuing anything differently. Now, verse 3, we see further evidence of how to blasphemy the way of the truth by commercializing re religion for selfish gain. Think about false teachers throughout history, and I think we see this, once again, because of our modern technology and internet and, and social media, we see this a lot. But false teachers are often characterized by a sexual sin, a lust for money, I'm driving a 20-year-old car, just so you guys know, <laughs> and dishonesty. It says all such teachers face condemnation and destruction. Once again, some pretty intense language that Peter's using here. One of the things, and he referred to this last week, that the false teachers were, were teaching is that the return of Christ was not a reality. That that's actually not going to happen. And so Peter's saying, do not sleep on this. Do not slumber. Don't get lazy and kind of just get in cruise control here. Because the reality is that, that God is going to return and that there's this thing called judgment that is going to take place. In other words, Peter doesn't want us to be unaware of these realities it's similar to a football team. All right, today's Sunday. I don't know if any of you watch football, but I guarantee what the football teams did all week long is they watched tape of the team. Well, probably they watched tape of last week, but they also, of their own mistakes, but they also watched tape of the teams they're going to play. Because they want to know what are their tactics. What are they really good at? Man, is their running game like really, really strong? We've got to fill this gap and fill this hole. Are they, they got a really good throwing game? And the wide receivers get around. Like, they want to know their tactics. So Peter's saying, I want you to know the tactics of the false teachers. I want you to be mindful so that you can replay this in your mind. Be ready for it. When you encounter it, you can call it out and recognize it. The second point today is God's judgment in the past. So in the second part, verses 4 through 8, we're going to see God's pattern of rescue and judgment. And, and he actually, Peter grabs three examples from Genesis. So let's look at example one, fallen angels in verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, Peter's referencing Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, if you want to go back and look this up later, where angels who sinned against God, now some of you, even I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot that was in the Bible, it's kind of sweet, had sexual relations with women and they had offspring with them. 
This is in the Bible, right? Like you might be like, this is this is wild. This is this is this some fantasy book that I'm reading here. Uh, the Jewish source Enoch, source Enoch, actually talks about this event. So the angels taught these women all sorts of secrets, and they had all sorts of sensualities with them. And in the end, they brought condemnation and judgment on themselves. Here's the point of this verse. These fallen angels, they await eternal judgment. Now here's the difference between angels and between us. God didn't provide a plan of redemption for angels. He never tells us that. They, they had everything going for them. They fell, right? There's some things we don't fully understand, but they fell. They rebelled against God. There is no plan of redemption. Their, their fate is sealed, and they are condemned forever. And what Peter is saying is that the same thing will happen to these false teachers. And if you follow the way of these false teachers. Example number two is Noah and the flood. You're probably a little bit more familiar with this, with this story. Right? It's typically, we think of this as like a kid's story. And the kids do like a program with Noah and the flood. And it's like, do you realize what this story is about? Like, that's kind of a dark story that we're, we're teaching kids. But verse five, it says, If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he says, if God did not spare the ancient world, but he did preserve Noah and his family, why can he not do the same again? Now, you might wonder, why did he spare Noah? What was special about Noah and his family? Because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he said that Noah was actually a herald, you know, one who kind of heralds, who proclaims the righteousness of God. And just like Noah, we today are called to be heralds of God's righteousness. For Noah, it was, get in the ark. Judgment is coming. The earth is going to be flooded. Like, we've all seen, is it Evan Almighty? Is that the one that, 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 that uh, Steve Carell was in, like, that, that basically captured that? It's one of those movies. But, like, yeah, it, you know, we see that. We're like, man, I can imagine if that's actually happening. Right? Portland gets a lot of rain. But imagine some guys out here building an ark. We're, like, taking this parking lot, like, get in. Right? We're like, this is crazy. This is, Noah's, this is what Noah's message, and it happened. So for us, it's come to the light. Right? Last week we talked about the light. We're in this darkness and we have this light to guide us. Come to the light by fleeing from sin and finding refuge in Jesus. That life can actually, you can be at peace in this world even in the midst of darkness. And so Peter's lesson for his readers is evident. God will protect those who resist the enticements of the false teachers. <coughs> the faithful will be vindicated by God. In the midst of perversion of our current age, that God can preserve us. If we do not become like the world. That leads me to example number three. Sodom and Gomorrah, verses six through eight. So Peter says, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. It tells us, he tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah were such a weak, wicked city, such a wicked place that God destroyed them, allowing them to be burned to ashes. This is a warning to us of God's coming judgment. But, this is also a warning that is evidence of God's mercy. In other words, it's, God, it's, it's God's way of saying it's not too late. Yes, there is a judgment coming. This is what's propped up. If you've ever heard of like um, hellfire and brimstone messages, right? Like that's kind of where this came from. They're like, look what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. But it's also God's mercy saying it's not too late. Like you are still in present active. And so if you aren't a Christian, heed this warning. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year, not 30 years from now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get right with God. You might say, why? Well, our brother James tells us because life is but a vapor. Think about the rainy mist that we get here, right? I was on a hike this weekend and you know, it was kind of misty. And all of a sudden it was like the mist was gone. And then it came back <laughs> because we live in the Northwest. And then it was gone. But our life is that way. We don't have all this time that we think that we have. I mean, I was just reflecting on my own life and uh, where I was 10 years ago. 
I was like, man, it feels like I blinked my eyes and I woke up and I'm here. And then that, that made me think, like, I kind of got, like, thinking of the future. And I was like, oh, no, I'm going to blink again. And if this was a movie, I could actually picture this. Like, where would I be and my kids in 10 years from now? But we don't have the time. And Peter's saying, right now you have the time. It's not too late yet, but it's going to go quickly. Lot was considered righteous. Now, if you know anything about Lot's life and if you study his life, he's not the ideal role model. If anything, Lot might give us some hope. But God, the God, they're not perfect. They simply live by faith. And that's what Lot was characterized by. He lived by faith. He was different from men in his day. His soul was tormented by what he saw and what he was experiencing. And so Lot and Noah both actually provide a beautiful picture for us of the gospel. Lot wasn't rescued because he was righteous. There wasn't like, man, that is a righteous man. God said, I'm going to rescue him for that. But he found grace and was changed within because of God. Same with Noah. It's the same with us. There's nothing that we do. We literally bring nothing to the table. We think about the table of communion that we respond to the end. Like, we don't bring anything to that table. It's God's righteousness and God giving us, imparting his righteousness to us. And so Paul is, I mean, Peter is demonstrating again that in the fullness of time that God always judges the wicked. He always has, he always will. And so that's why he's rewinding the tape, saying, look, look at these examples. They've happened. This is going to happen again. And he's also reminding us with Sodom and Gomorrah that it is possible to live a godly life. Remember chapter one, it says pursue godliness. It is possible to live a godly life in an ungodly society and city. So he says that was possible in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's possible for us in the city of Portland. And as, Port, uh, as Peter told us in verse uh, three of chapter one, his divine power has granted to us all things. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So if you're in him, you already have it. He's given it to you through his power, through his strength. And hear this. Nobody is exempt from judgment. Although it may be delayed for a while, it's part of like even living this life, it will take place as we remember the flooded world with Noah. But God's judgment can be escaped. Right? Now, we all face a judgment day where we stand before the Lord face to face, but it, his judgment can be escaped, and he gives us a way to escape. Like That's where the good news comes in. So if you do go out to lunch with a friend, you say, man, our pastor's talking about judgment and, and hell and, and Sodom and Gomorrah being turned to ashes. Make sure you add this part, but there's this rescue where we don't have to experience that. And so take the moment to behold the beautiful picture of the gospel that we find here. Neither Noah or Lot brought anything to the table by which they could rescue themselves. They didn't have these things, and it was God's like, of course I've got to rescue you, because look how righteous you are. They didn't do, have anything they could do to earn God's favor. They couldn't try hard enough. They couldn't be good enough. They couldn't serve enough. They couldn't give enough money. There was nothing they could do that would make them earn God's favor. But both of these men received faith by God's judgment and instructions, and therefore his righteousness was credited to them because of what Jesus did. His righteousness was given to them. It's like, now I've got this credit. It's like, what makes you righteous before God? Like when you face God face to face? Jesus. 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 And that God imputed his own righteousness to them because they trusted him. It's there freely for all of us. That's the good news. We just have to put our trust in him. Church, Jesus doesn't save us because we're all cleaned up and we deserve a salvation but because we simply act in faith on what he has already done for us. That's why Jesus saves us. And so Peter gives us these three examples from the past. And he tries to convince the believers in his own day. He's saying, look, pay attention to the false teachers. Because you know, I see Peter as like this big brother figure. Like, I don't want this to happen to you. I don't want you to be swayed by what is going to come in, by these false teachers who are denying the second coming of Christ and who are denying that a future judgment will come. I want you to pursue godliness. Be protected. And then finally, number three, God's rescue and judgment. If we look at verses 9 and 10 and we'll wrap up. Verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So having given us these three examples, the, the angels, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he gave us two uh, examples of divine preservation. He used Noah and Lot. <clears throat> Peter now brings everything together, and he presents this two-part conclusion to us. 
First, the Lord knows how to preserve and rescue the godly in their trials. Second, he knows how to keep the unrighteous for the future day of judgment. Peter's reiterating what he's already told us. He's just trying to kind of tie it all together, put a nice bow on it. He's saying, look, God rescued Noah. At the same time, he flooded the earth. God rescued Lot. At the same time, he punished the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Peter is now calling his readers, including us, he's saying, look, guys, avoid making the same mistake as these individuals, the, 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 the wicked city of Sodom and Gomorrah, those in, in Noah's day. And don't despise authority. It tells us that, 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 that last verse of part 10. It says they despised authority. And so we mu must not be those who follow the instincts of the flesh. We must not drift into rebellion. Last week we looked at the idea of drifting. We must not drift into rebellion against God. We must pursue godliness by submitting to Jesus' authority, to the authority in God's word. And so our conclusion, our takeaways, the Apostle Peter's words reflect the words and the reality of every generation. We'll all face the same reality. We're always going to have the threat of the society around us to extinguish the light of God's word, right? This is irrelevant. You can't follow this. It's full of error. It's outdated. And said we want to chase after relativism. Right? That's why you hear churches like, I remember when I first started getting involved in church planning, and you kind of hear some, but it's gotten away from it, thankfully. But it was like, we're a relative church. Right? We're relative, and we, we're, we're this, and like, we're trying to be hip and cool. And you know, I probably bought into that first season, and I'm like, it doesn't work. <laughs> what you win them with, you have to keep them with. I say relative because of God's word, but not, we not be relative to culture. We see that they, in our society, we, we chase sexual immorality. Right? I'm not going to harp on that one. I'll let you fill in the blank. We can discuss it later. We see the abuse of, of, of leaders buying into monetary wealth. Right? Uh, I would have chosen a way different business plan <laughs> if it was about greed and making a lot of money or going with a very different tribe of churches, some of, the, these, some of these false ones. That's where the whole idea of this health and wealth, prosperity gospel comes from, Right? They're the ones driving the jets and, and, the, and the Lamborghinis and all these things. And so Peter wants us to know the destiny of these false teachers. But the Holy Spirit wants to remind us what awaits all who reject the gospel. If God did not spare his own angels, if God did not spare the people of Noah's day, if God did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, what makes any one of us, for that matter, think that we'll get out of jail free car? This isn't monopoly. This is real life. And so Peter's words compel us to stay the course, pursue godliness, be cautious of false teachers. And then they compel us to share this message of the gospel, this good news with every tribe, nation, and tongue. This is why we should be motivated, and we are motivated as church to do missions globally. Yes, here locally in our city, but also globally. We care about the unreached people groups, those who've never heard the name of Jesus, because we want to warn them of the coming judgment, but we also want to offer them the glorious hope before it's too late that you can put your trust and faith in Jesus. And so whether we like it or not, God's condemnation is real and necessary because it's rooted in his justice. There's a word our culture likes, justice, right? We want justice, rightfully so. This is where I think, once again, we can lean into the conversation in our culture, in our city, and say, yeah, I'm all for justice. And we can even show where God's a just God, where true justice actually comes from. And so for Christians, Jesus Christ has already incurred God's wrath against sin through his love for us. God loved us so much that he, he incurred that, the, the, the cross and he met us, the righteous requirements that now that when we go to God, we say, look, here's the righteousness. It's Jesus. For non-Christians, we see the eventual outcome. But hear this clearly. It's not too late because God loves you. God loves our city, and he's offering a way of salvation. And part of this, and this is where it's like, this isn't Matt's job, okay? It's not Ben's job. It's all of our job. We're conduits of that good news. No, you may not get a, a chance to stand in front of a handful of people and proclaim this message, but you get to sit next to somebody at work, or you get to Zoom with somebody. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure where we're at in society and, and life. You've got a neighbor. you you got friends who want to get around the fire pit, right? You get to be conduits of this good news and this, this truth. And so, Sojourn, may we continue to faithfully practice the way of truth in our city and invite others to come join us in the way. Amen?
I'm going to pray for us and then lead us uh, in how we respond this morning. God, today was a difficult passage, if we're honest. God, it's not a, not a, a banner that we could put out or a sermon series or a message that would draw in the masses. Come hear about the judgment of God. Come rewind the tape and look how he's done it in the past. But God, it's in your word for a reason. And God, may we be reminded that yes, there is a coming judgment, but God, that is the warning. That you, you have shown your mercy and grace that we don't have to experience it like Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't have to experience it like those in Noah's day. God, that you have given us a way out in your son, Jesus Christ, and may we submit to him and follow him as we pursue godliness and invite others on that journey of learning what it means to follow you. God, I'm desperate to see those in our city come to embrace you and that message. God, there is a reality that there is a judgment coming, but it's not too late. And so God, may we be reminded of that this morning, that yes, we are to pursue godliness. Yes, we're to be cautious of false teachers in our midst and in our city, but God, that we are also conduits of this grace and that we are to go and invite those people on this journey because it's not too late for them. God, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So here's how we're going to respond uh, this morning. First is worship kind of with a heart and posture of worship as we praise God, thank God for his mercy and for his grace in our lives. And so um, you know, Ben's gonna, he'll, he'll lead us in a couple of songs in response. Uh, the other is uh, prayer. Uh, just the idea that we minister to one another. And we're trying to think creatively through like how do we get more people even involved and in praying for one another. Um, but at least for this week, for this, this uh, Sunday, um, I'll just kind of hang towards the back during this first song, if you say, man, I need prayer for something. Could you pray for this? Or I've got a question. Like, feel free to come back. And, and if not, we can wait till the service is over. And, and you feel free to grab somebody else as we minister to one another. And then the final way we're going to respond is through communion. As the table is set and prepared there in the back. Uh, this is a family meal for anyone who's put their trust in Jesus. Um, if you think about the communion meal, it re or reorients our life are relocating us in the story told by the word. As we go to the table, we remind us more this morning, instead of being defined by the stories of our culture, instead of being defined by our weeks, good or bad, however we came in here this morning, that we get to live as active participants in God's story. And the meal that we take and consume, it points to this goal. That we're eating in the presence of God as a celebration of his generosity. I think sometimes I thought as a kid, like, so the community is really sad. And yes, there is a part where you reflect and maybe you mourn over your sin, but like, as you get ready to take it, like, it should be a joyous occasion for the reminder of what it is. That God has given us salvation. And that we anticipate this in every meal, but especially in the Lord's Supper, what it means. And so during the first song, we're going to have two songs. During the first song, grab your elements. Take, take a moment. Seek the Lord. Reflect on your life, where you're at. Pray to Him. And then I'll come back up and lead us in the actual taking of communion. And so sojourn, the table is open. The time is yours. Respond before me. Satan sends me 
for God the just is satisfied. So look on him and pardon me. So look on him and pardon me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise to death, those ongoing things that we struggle with in light of the fact that Jesus has already died for our sins. He's already paid the penalty for them. And that should compel us to pursue godliness as Peter's telling us. And it should also remind us to examine ourselves and to repent of our sin before partaking in the suffering. Third, it shows us the unity of God's people around the person and the work of Jesus. That's why it's a, a family meal. And it's a unifying factor as us as Sojourn Church that it kind of that reminder that we all come to the table and we bring nothing. It's only because of God and his righteousness that we can partake together and be unified as a church. And the final reminder is it anticipates our participation in the marriage supper of the, of the Lamb when his kingdom comes in its fullness. That second coming that Peter's referring to. And that we get to all, that'll be a glorious day. A feast of all feasts that we, we can't even fathom or imagine what it'll be like. And that we'll get to be there. And so in Luke 22, verse 19, it says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it to them and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you may take the bread. Verse 20, it says, And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus' blood was shed for you, for your sins, and for the sins of the world. You may take the cup and drink. So I would eat the 
I would just do the announcements before we leave. Um, <laughs> um, two announcements. The first one for the month of November, we will do a toy drive we did last year. And the, the men at the uh, Portland Rescue Mission, they don't have an income to provide for their kids uh, for Christmas. So uh, many other churches like ours are bringing, collecting toys. So from 9 to 12, we can drop it off. We will have our big tab. We can drop toys uh, for them to provide for their children in Christmas. So we will do that for the month of November. And then the second announcement is our fall retreat, three weeks away. Woo we will have um, we will have people coming to do our children uh, time, so we can have all the ages cover, getting um, fun, but also teaching and also encouragement. And we can wait uh, for that. So if you have any question. Um, or anything, please reach out, but we can wait. So um, go and be the church, and God bless you. <laughs>